every now and then, well, not every now and then, we get letters every single month, but every now and then, I like to read a letter, and I encourage you, there's lots of letters in the lobby, there's lots of news uh, articles in the lobby, um, newsletters. Um, if you'd like to sign up for any of those, you can go and sign up. We have 106 missionaries um, that you can sign up and get their information. Some do um, monthly, some do quarterly, some cannot do it at all, because you're actually supporting three ghost pastors now, we have no idea where they are, but obviously the team that uh, Far Reaching Ministry that supports them, they know where they are, but they're in Afghanistan, Pakistan, possibly Iran, Iraq, so they cannot be, it cannot be divulged who they are. And so some of them, just, you'll just need to pray for. And if you'd like to pray for a specific missionary, we do have a list, and right now I think we have about 80 of the missionaries covered. We'd like to get all 100 missionaries covered in prayer and communication. And so if you'd like to do that, help us do that, you can see Matt, who is playing the drums this morning. Uh, he oversees the mission. So this is from New Life International, one of the missionaries that you support. A New Life team member recently traveled through the harsh terrain in Guatemala to reach the desperate Mexican refugees. Now, this is handwritten. Every, every month they give us, they have to give us by law, a letter that states what we donated to them uh, per the federal government. And so this is handwritten. Who had fled drug cartel violence in their home country. He shared safe water food supplies, and the hope of the gospel message. Thank you, thank you all for your ministry support. God bless. So I encourage you to, amen, amen. We are, you are doing a work. And as we look at Revelation chapter 18, when we get to heaven, we'll get to see what that work was. But God is using you. Uh, praise God, I'm getting ready to send out uh, checks this coming week. Um, and just the checks alone are now up to 29,000, um, we added two more missionaries, $29,700 that you're going to be sending out this week for missionary work. Also, some of you, just so you know, um, some of you give funds, and I don't know who gives funds, as all as I know is the bottom line, I don't see any names, none of that. But some of you have been giving money to other missionaries, and just so you know, that money is passed along. And if you've been giving money to Ethiopia, um, we're sending out a $1,500 check to Ethiopia, the missions that we serve, uh, minister to in, in Ethiopia. So um, I know some people kind of wonder, you know, is my money really getting there? Um, your money is very important to us because it was your money. Now it's God's money. We take it very, very seriously. Um, we could not be doing 40% of everything you give to the mission field if we are not taking finances seriously. So we take it very, very seriously, and I, I hope that you do as well. Your finances are God's finances given to you on loan. And that's what we're going to look at this morning in chapter 18 of Revelation. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, if you're new or visiting, this is John. John is having a vision called Revelation, and so John is writing down through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit this vision that he has been seeing. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have, come, have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed. Mix double for her. In the measure that she's glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow, I will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Father, we continue in our study of your word. And Father, thank you for what we're going to see but when we get to heaven, we're going to be in your throne room. This is, this is for us to learn of now and for those who are going through the great tribulation to learn and to repent. So, Father, we thank you for showing us what's going to take place in advance, that Israel is going to be there. 
that the Temple Mount is where the temple belongs and the temple is going to be rebuilt. That they're going to be offering sacrifices once again and the abomination of desolation will be set up in the Holy of Holies. The one world economy, that, that one where that mark where you'll be able to not buy or sell without the mark of the beast will take place halfway through the Great Tribulation. Father, we thank you for all this information. For we know that you're a God of order and you're a God of control. So I pray for the gift of teaching this morning and that our hearts individually, as well as corporately, Father, I, I think most of us would acknowledge we don't need another Bible study. We need a heart transformation, a soul. Our souls need to be transformed, become more like you. So fathers, I, I teach, I pray uh, that it will come across effectively, that we'll learn this morning about our own lives, about our own finances, and how to be efficient with them, effective with them not cling to them, nor allow them to cling to us, that you will be glorified, Lord, through this message this morning. Pray for the gift of teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Notice another angel having great authority and the earth, so he's coming from heaven to earth, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. After the destruction of the various religious systems of the world, that is very, very important, what I just said there. After the destruction of the various religious systems of the world, which will take place at the midway point of the Great Tribulation, John's vision turns towards the monetary commercial system. That's what we're going to be looking at here in chapter 18. Now, we don't know exactly when this destruction will take place, but it will probably be towards the end of the tribulation period. Notice after these things, which means that we shouldn't combine chapters 17 and 18 together. The religious Babylonian system in chapter 17, which is all of the various religious systems, not a place is destroyed by the Antichrist, and who else? The ten kings, or those ten regions around the world, the ten toes that Daniel prophesied about. A city representing Babylon in chapter 18 is destroyed by God. So chapter 17, we see destruction by man of the religious systems, Chapter 18, we see the destruction of the monetary commercial system by God. You see, chapter 17, the people rejoiced over the newly instituted one world religious system. Chapter 18, the people mourn over the destruction of the city that hosted the one world monetary commercial system. Revelation 14, 8 says this, And another angel followed, Babylon has fallen, that great city, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In Revelation 19, which we'll get to in a few weeks, after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. You hear what they're proclaiming in heaven? As we're marching down this road towards November, God already knows who won. Rest. Register, study, vote, learn to rest in the sovereignty of God. It'll make your life and so many other people's lives so much better. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Verses 2 and 3, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations, notice this again, all, all, all. There is going to be a one world economic system and we are being conditioned for that right now. The world, is, the world as well as this country is ready to implode. 
America, as you know, $35 trillion in debt. America. The world, $93 trillion in debt. We have a third of the world, over a third of the world's debt. One trillion now, one trillion per year in interest alone. Will we recover? Not without a great reset. It's impossible, especially the way we keep spending. When I say we, I mean the administration and the government. It's happening faster, quicker. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of their fornication. The kings of the earth, notice the kings, those ten kings, have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich, even during the great tribulation. This is hard, isn't it? Hard to comprehend. How could that happen? Well, if you've got a backhoe, there's going to be a lot of burying that needs to be done. If you're not saved, that might be a good industry to get into if you survive. But it's best to come to know Jesus as your Savior because you, you probably won't survive. Have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Babylon the Great is fallen. The first question that pops into our minds is probably, which Babylon is this? I thought that we just studied that Babylon was destroyed in the previous chapter. It's a very good question. I personally think that chapter 17, as I've already mentioned, deals with the global religious Babylon where chapter 18 deals with a city, a city that has a positive financial impact upon the whole world. Now, the commonly suggested cities are Jerusalem, Rome, and Babylon of the Old Testament. But just like I mentioned in chapter 17, we don't want to argue about what city it is, but look at the overriding principle found in this chapter. This commercial enterprise is totally wiped out. And the merchants of the earth mourn over their loss. The destroyed city becomes a dwelling place of demons and other bizarre spiritual forces. But if we really think about it, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, maybe you're new to the faith, they were always there behind the scenes. Ephesians tells us what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But God uses this angel to pull the spiritual blinders off and behold, the influencers behind the scenes are revealed. The last thing I'd like to point out about this, uh, these verses here is just like in chapter 17, the kings of the earth were committing spiritual fornication with this system. Chapter 17 dealt with the world placing a religious system above God. And in our chapter here this morning, the world places a commercial system above God. In both cases, we see idolatry. And this can apply to you and me as believers this morning. If we place anything above our relationship with God, we are committing idolatry or someone else above God. And harlotry, which is, because that seems like a harsh word for a Sunday morning, prostitution. It is a harsh word. It's called spiritual unfaithfulness. Spiritual unfaithfulness. You're placing something above God, and we are called the what in the Scriptures? The church is called the bride of Christ. We're to be pure. We're to be holy. That doesn't have to do with anything like we automatically think of a female wearing a dress. No, 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 no. It's the analogy of a bride, pure and holy. And so if we go out and put something above God, we're committing idolatry as well as harlotry. We're committing adultery as we keep the theme of chapter 8, 17 and 18 here. How about verses 4 and 5? And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. So not another angel, just as another voice. Lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. You see, there will be believers alive during the great tribulation period. And yes, the temptation for riches will still be within their soul. 
Here we're seeing that this, the believer at this time is given a timeless exhortation. So when people tell you young people, you young people, please listen, where they tell, might say to you, well, you know, the Bible is irrelevant, it's archaic, it, it doesn't make any sense, it's, it's not applicable to our lives today. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a timeless principle, <laughs> almost 2,000 years old. So now you can know in your mind, okay, it's, it might be archaic, but it's totally relevant, it's totally practical, it's totally applicable. So you don't believe the lies of this world. The angel tells them, again, to come out and not partake of the system. Who's the angel talking to? The believer. Well, I say angel. I should, you know what, Randy? We need to correct that. I mean, I'm sorry. We need to correct that because it just says a voice. So I can't say it's an angel's voice. I, I'm sorry. I need to correct that. So it's just a voice tells them to come out and not partake of the system because the system is going to be judged by God. So since the church, as we know it today, is not going to be here during this time of the tribulation, what can we draw from this personally for our lives today? Well, let's look at 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. Thank you, Randy, for doing that. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. So if you're not familiar with your Bible, we encourage you to get familiar with your Bible, your paper Bible. Um, really encourage you to forego your phone. Uh, if you need it for font, I totally get it. But get used to your Bible. Get used to where these pages, uh, these books are, these letters. They're really letters. And so Paul writes to Timothy, a pastor. In 1 Timothy 6, 6, he says this. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, is that something that a principle there that we could all use in our lives today, even though it was written almost 2,000 years ago? Contentment. Do we have contentment in America? Do we know how many billions of dollars are spent on cosmetics every single year in America? Now, this is not a bash. There's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself. I'm not insinuating that at all. So don't go down that road. Nothing wrong with taking care of yourself. But I'm just, get the bigger picture. What are we investing in? And when I say we, I mean America. Cosmetic surgeries, multi, multi-billion dollar industry. What are we investing in as Americans? We're investing in the exterior. It's important what people see. No, it's what God knows that's important. And God knows according to his word that we're all sinners in need of a savior. And you can go, you can die the best looking person, the best looking sinner on the earth. You can die that way. You're still going to hell. And God is concerned about your soul. So again, don't take an extreme. Take care of yourself. Take care of the temple of God. It's, it's what the Bible says our temple. Men and women, take care of it. But make sure that you're doing it properly, that you have also contentment. Contentment. My wife and I like to say each other, and we've been saying it now for about 20 years, let's grow old gracefully. Let's grow old gracefully. And we just embrace it. I, I, my, my, my brain says I can still do things, and my body says, no, you can't. And that's frustrating. But at the same time, I just go, you know, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Who cares? I got my brand new body waiting for me. Hopefully I get it today. Let's go. Let's go. So have contentment. For we brought nothing. I love this. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. You ain't taking a U-Haul with you. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Everything else, whew. But those who desire to be rich, so now Paul talks to Timothy, a pastor, and to you and I as Christians, the Holy Spirit addressing money. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men, and men here is mankind, male and females, and drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root 
of all kinds of evil. Notice it does not say, for money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, no, no. For the love of money. We need money. We need finances. It's the love. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. Guys, almost 2,000 years ago, what does Paul just say about the church? Some in the church. That some believers in the church, he's not talking about the unbelieving world. He said right there in your Bible that some within the church have strayed from the faith. They got their eyes off of God and they got their eyes on money in this particular case. It could be a hobby. It could be any number of things that we could list here. You get your eyes off of God, you're going to go somewhere else. Where's that going to be? And pierce himself through with many sorrows. You see, those who are within this system in chapter 18 love the idea of financial gain. I'm not talking about the believer. I'm saying in general now, pull back. As we look at the whole chapter, those who are within this system in chapter 18, they love the ideal of financial gain, which is very easy to prove as we move through our text this morning. But how are we as saints in this area? We always want to try to make it applicable to us. How are we as saints? How is the Christian church in this area? Think of the church in America and the universal church. What has taken place in the last 20 years? Is it all about trying to get people to come in through various means just to get them in the door? Or is it the gospel? Most churches will not address sin. They won't even use the word sin today in America. Most churches will not use the word repentance because that means I need to turn. I need to forsake worldly things and seek God. That's the church in America today. We're in desperate straits. You see, money is obviously not a bad thing, but if we place it above God, then we allow it to become a bad thing. Hence, the exhortation from Revelation and elsewhere in Scriptures to come out from under that influence. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich. So now Paul is writing to Timothy, that as Timothy teaches, and notice what Paul says. He doesn't say recommend, suggest, He tells Timothy, you command, you command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And you might think, well, this is not applicable to us. Well, my dad was alive during the Great Depression. He was born in 1919. And in one day, one day, America crashed. All of America crashed. In 20, uh, 28, 2008, 2008, some of you remember, some of you weren't born, but some of you remember what happened in 2008. The world crashed in one day. In both of those times, people committed suicide because their trust was in their belongings. Their trust was in their cash. Nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, which is actually a gift via the Holy Spirit, by the way. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. How about Matthew 6? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, this is Jesus speaking. So you're going, well, you know, that was Paul. You know, who cares? Okay, let's go to Jesus. Where moth and rust destroyed, where thieves break in and steal. Huh, that sounds like America, right? Well, Jesus is encouraging. Don't do it. Now, I'm not saying, you know, again, don't go to any extreme. If you come to our house, we have a lot of nice things. We have a lot of toys. We, we love our grandkids. We have a blast. So don't go on, you know, on any extreme. Keep it with the text. Are you, are you trusting in your riches? Are you trusting in your money? Are you seeking after money? I just got to have more money. Just got to have more money. Just got to have more money. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
Why? This is Jesus speaking. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, with the parking, we have a parking situation. And I, and I know many of you don't understand this, and so I want to share this. That's not a put down. That's just, just a reality. You wouldn't know this because you haven't studied it. You might think, well, you know what? Why don't we just pave that back dirt area back there and we can get a lot more cars in? <laughs> that doesn't increase the parking. And just so you know, to pave that back area would be about $200,000 today. Feel free to fact check me. Maybe you can get it for 180. We still ain't going to do it. But that's the bigger picture. That's why we need to park out on the grass so that when people drive in, they don't drive out because there's no parking spots. That's why we're doing this. And so keep thinking big picture. We want people to come to know Jesus as their Savior. It's not about numbers. I have no idea how many people are in here right now. I mean, I have a rough idea, but we don't do numbers. We don't have roles. We're not interested in your money. We're interested in your soul. What you give of your funds, we're going to make sure we spend it wisely and efficiently. I think you're seeing that. And so Jesus says what? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. We're, we're, I, I have a 401k, just so you know. I have a retirement package. But I'm not trusting in that. Because <laughs> that's going to go away lickety split. I'm just like, hey, if it's there, great. If it's not, who cares? God's going to take care of me. How about Colossians 3? If then you were raised with Christ, if you're a born-again believer, if you know Jesus as your Savior, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Invest in the kingdom. Invest in the kingdom. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Again, none of these verses negate earthly responsibility. That's why we take care of our buildings around here. Let's look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. You know, Jesus says, occupy. Be busy about my father's business. Right now, this Sunday morning, I, with my calling as a pastor and the gift of teaching, I'm busy about my father's business by hoping to raise up disciples to follow Jesus and to go out and do the work of the ministry. Ephesians, that's what this is all about. The rest of the week, I'm doing other things, and so is the staff, and so are you. We're to be about our Father's business throughout the week, not just on a Sunday morning. Well, Luke 18 says this, Now a certain ruler asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. What are those all? Those are exterior. Those are exterior, external things. And this young man said, and I believe this is actually John Mark, we'll get to this later on, in a few years as we go through the Gospels, and he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he strongly rebuked him and said, you liar, you need to repent right now today. Did he say that? See, read your Bible. Isn't this amazing? Jesus did not call this young man on the carpet. He, what he said was true. Jesus, I, 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 I'm trying. I haven't done these things. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Another gospel tells us that Jesus looked on him and loved him loved him. Hmm. You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, right now, I could go into Christian fiction and encourage all of you to sell everything you have and give it all to the church. Taking it totally out of context, this is one man and Jesus is dealing with this one man's soul, his issue, money. So if you ever hear this from the Christian fiction, turn it off, run away from it. It's taking it totally out of context. But pastors, ministers will use it for such. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very sick, rich, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. 
For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, These things which, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly I say to you, and this is for you and me today, There is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and the age to come eternal life. Romans 12. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we see some of the gifts being displayed here. There's nothing wrong with being blessed with financial wealth. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just that we need to make sure that we have control over our finances and that our finances do not have control over us. Very, very important. As I just noted in the scriptures, financial wealth can be a tremendous blessing, but it can also be a tremendous curse. And as a believer, when God blesses a person with financial wealth, then God is calling that person to a greater accountability, to a greater accountability. It's just like any other biblical principle. God holds every believer accountable for what he has freely given to them, monetary or otherwise. Verses 6 and 7. Render to her just as, you, as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works, Revelation 18, 6. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the pleasure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure. Notice, this is during the tribulation. This is the second half of the tribulation, probably close to the end of the tribulation. So some people are going to still be able to live luxuriously. For she says in her heart, notice what she says here in her heart. I sit as queen. I am no widow. I will not see sorrow. You see, the angel addresses God. He's not telling God what to do, but pointing out the facts for our benefit. This commercial system thinks that it's indestructible. As they will find out, nothing is indestructible when you're dealing with God. Always keep in the forefront of your understanding that God is in control. Always do that not the spiritual forces of this world. Don't look for Satan behind every bush. Look for God through his word and the circumstances that are taking place. Look for God. God has a plan and a purpose by what's happening to our country right now. Therefore, verse 8, her plagues will come on her. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. This could be the same thing that took place with Sodom and Gomorrah. God is going to judge this city, and it's going to go up in smoke in a specific hour. Let's read on. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance... For fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city. Again, notice this is a city. This is a city, not a religious system around the whole world. This is a city. For in one hour, so it went from a one day to now, for in one hour, your judgment has come. The world is going to observe her destruction and notice that the world is looking from a distance. And with our modern technological advances, it's going to be very easy for everyone to see this taking place. You see, once again, it's going to be obvious that this is the judgment of God, not the judgment of man. 
The people of this earth have been witnessing God's judgment for several years now. They just keep hoping that it wouldn't come upon the wealthy aspect of their own lives. But here it is. Does this maybe sound like America right now? They just kept hoping that it wouldn't come upon the wealthy aspect of their own lives. Let's make America great again. Let's make America wealthy again. Let's make America strong again. Let's put whatever phrase you want to put after it. How about let's repent from killing our babies? Let's repent for the sex trafficking that is taking place in various states around this country. How about let's repent? No. No, no, no. It's all about money. We got to be great again. We got to show everybody who we are. The powerful elite of our day think that they're getting away with the evil things that they are doing and endorsing. They are not. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, over this city, which I believe to be Rome. For no one buys her merchandise anymore. One day, one hour, party's over. Merchandise of what? Of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots. And I have this last part highlighted in my Bible. I encourage you to highlight your Bible if you're new to your Bible and bodies and souls of men. Again, that's mankind. You see, this is the worst financial disaster that has ever happened, as we've already seen that during the tribulation, the world's food and water supply is going to be greatly impacted. So the merchants of this city have financially gained tremendously over the loss of others. But now it's their turn. Notice the list. It includes includes merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls. So we could maybe say this is the jewelry business. It includes fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet. So we can maybe say the, the clothing business. It includes every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble. So maybe we could say this is the household item business. It includes cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense. So maybe we could say this is the spice and fragrance business. It includes wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep. So we could say the cooking and food business. It includes horses and chariots. So we could say the transportation business. It includes bodies of souls of men. And we could say the labor force business. The merchants of the world gained monetarily from this tremendous list, but they are now weeping because of their lust for one, for more will no longer be fulfilled. For their lust will no longer be fulfilled. Notice that repentance. As we read this list, did you notice something? Notice that repentance is not taking place just mourning over their own personal financial loss. You see how this is applicable to you and I today? This is very applicable to the church today. It might even be applicable to you personally. I don't know. It's between you and God. Verses 14 through 19. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed with fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches have come to nothing." Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate." 
Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. I have that highlighted. Again, God is in control. Please read this week. This just popped into my head. It's not my notes. But I encourage you to read Psalm 37 and then Psalm 73. Read Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. So if you're dyslexic, you're going to get it right both times. 37, we have a son that's that way. 37, 73. Read those. That's exactly what we just read right here. This last verse is exactly Psalm 37, Psalm 73. Rejoice over here, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged her, avenged, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel, so now a different angel, took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, most likely the Mediterranean Sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. And the sound of the millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of, the lamp, of a lamp shall not shine in you any more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, all, all, the nations were deceived. Remember the enemies as the music team comes up? You remember what our enemy's number one tactic is? Does anybody remember? It's Revelation chapter 12. Deception. Deception. Guys, the enemy has a plan for America. God has a better plan, a greater plan. I shouldn't say better, a greater plan. It might be for destruction. I don't know I'm not God. But I'm just saying, God, your will be done. Whatever you want, your will be done because you know what you're doing. You know what it takes to bring mankind to their knees. You know what it takes, Father, so your will be done. Verse 24, and in her, which I believe to be Rome, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. God's timing, guys. God's timing. But again, make this, make this a practical for you and me. Financial devastation in one day, which should cause us to ask a simple question. You and me, an honest, simple, <coughs> married, not married, young, old. I, I would venture to say that everyone in this room, unless you're still going to high school or college, you have finances that you're responsible for and that you need. So you need to ask yourself this question on a regular basis. Have I evaluated my pursuit of finances? Have I elevated? I'm sorry. Have I elevated my pursuit of finances above my pursuit of God? This is what we're seeing in this chapter. No mention of repentance, no remorse. Who cares about people? We lost all our money. I, I encourage you. Have I evaluated my pursuit of finances above my pursuit of God? Again, if you don't have time to read your Bible, ask yourself why. Don't play games. Just ask yourself why. Your Bible needs to be your first love. Father, we thank you and praise you via your Holy Spirit that you will give us strength to read our Bibles, to read the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And we'll see the truth, and the truth will set us free. So, Father, help us to read our Bibles each and every day, to spend 15, 20, 30 minutes a day. If we have to get up a little bit earlier, if we have to do it during our lunch break, whenever it might be, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us that desire and give us the strength, give us the, the awareness that we need to invest in the kingdom of God, to invest in your word. And this morning, Father, as we look at the, the topic here, the theme of this chapter, help us to also evaluate our, our finances. How are we spending them? What are we spending them on? Are we, being, uh, are we being wise stewards, Father? I'm sure we could all improve on this area, so there's no guilt or condemnation, Father. But are we being wise stewards? 
And what would you have us to, to do about that, Father? What would you have us to tweak? What would you have us maybe to give up totally? What, what is it? This, this young man who was so rich, Jesus said, you just lack one thing. Just one thing. This young man's, and he's a ruler from the other Gospels, this rich young ruler had allowed his possessions to possess him. Covetousness. Covetousness. Father, guard our hearts that will take care of what you give to us, but that will hold on to it lightly. For none of us knows when we might leave this earth. You hold our very breath. Help us to be good stewards individually, whether we're single or married, young, old. Continue to give us wisdom, Lord, as a church, that we'd spend your funds wisely, efficiently, effectively. Father, we pray for Israel, but not just for Israel, Lord, for the Palestinians, for Hamas, for Hezbollah, for the Houthis, for Iran. We pray for eight plus billion people that they would come to know Jesus as their Savior before they leave this earth. For eternity is forever and hell is hot. Father, use us this week for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.